It's uh, my high honor and privilege to introduce the next, next speaker, Richard uh, Shepard. Uh, lives in uh, McLean, Virginia, joined the Marine Corps at fall of 68. Um, he was commissioned in December of that year, basic school class 769, an artillery guy, served in Vietnam, forward observer with Delta Company 15, um, also served with uh, 2nd Battalion 11th Marines on the staff, joined the Central Intelligence Agency in 73 after a year of graduate work at Columbia University and has uh, ultimately reached the rank of Major United States Marine Corps Reserve. Please give him a warm welcome. Good morning. It's a great honor for me to be here with all of you veterans who saw much more of the war probably than I did. But since we're talking about Tet, I want to give you an idea of what it was like to go into the Marine Corps after Tet and deal with some of the challenges that we faced in the field. Um, Tet, in the end, cast a long shadow over my tour in Vietnam, but I wasn't really focused on it when it occurred. I was in college. Uh, I was a senior. I was attempting to get through a thesis, uh, study for comprehensives, and so forth. But I knew at the end of this, I didn't have an onward plan. Um, I was going to be drafted. We didn't have a lottery. And the nasty lady who ran my draft board told me I was number one on her hit list. <laughs> so, uh, and I wanted to join the Marines. Now, this was not a popular decision with my family because even though we had a long Marine tradition, um, my uncle and the man I was named for, my mother's only sibling, was killed on Iwo Jima. Uh, my father served as a bomb disposal officer in the Pacific. And my mother and grandmother were very upset with the idea of me going out and becoming cannon fodder. Uh, I, in order to placate them, I tried to join the Navy. And the Navy didn't want me. First of all, they lost all my paperwork, and second of all, they decided since I wasn't an engineer, I wasn't going to make a good line officer. So I picked up all of my paperwork in New York at the recruiting station, and I took it downstairs to the Marine Corps, and I said, here, it's all Department of the Navy paperwork, what the hell? And I was in within three weeks. <laughs> and I, would, I remember when I was sworn in, um, which was the day before I was due to report for induction, I remember the captain swearing me in, calling my draft board, and letting them know the bad news that I wasn't going to be coming. Uh, I entered uh, OCS in October of 1969, 68, sorry, uh, where one of my instructors was Lieutenant General Labuti, currently, or at that time he was a lieutenant, and I remember him especially well. He wouldn't remember me. Um, for two things. One was for very gently and tenderly encouraging me on the speed march reaction course. And the other was for telling us the difference between a fairy tale and a sea story. And the answer to that question is a fairy, a fairy tale begins with uh, once upon a time and a sea story begins with this is no shit. He probably does not like the idea that I remember him for that, but I do appreciate his, his instruction. It was very valuable. And I'm here, you know, I came back alive. <clears throat> After OCS, I went to a TBS, class of uh, 769, graduated in June, went to artillery school, and got to Vietnam in September of 69, uh, on my birthday, as it turned out, and also the day the monsoon arrived, which was nasty. I was told I was going to be assigned to 2nd Battalion, 11th Marines, which at that time was uh, stationed in An Hoa, Guangnam Province. <clears throat> and it was also known colloquially as Rocket Alley. And I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. Once I got there and settled into the battery, I was assigned to Delta 15 as a forward observer 
and I stayed with that company for about four months. Uh, after that, I returned to the battery and I became a fire direction officer for the rest of my tour. Rather unusually at the time, I did stay with my battery for the entire tour. A lot of people moved in and out and so forth, but I stayed with them. And I think in retrospect, looking at my classmates and looking at the people I was serving with, we all had doubts <clears throat> about the war. Um, but when I was in training, that wasn't really discussed much. Uh, we were trying to be good Marines. We were training as best we could to stay alive in the field. And <clears throat> generally trying to, to sound upbeat and be positive. I think Headquarters Marine Corps recognized that there was some doubt within its, its junior officers. And so General Walt came down from headquarters to talk to us. And he was very upbeat, very typical General Walt. Uh, but he did make one comment that I remember well. He said, you know, there's probably a strong argument that our boys shouldn't be over there, uh, which stuck with me because obviously he had the same thoughts going through his head as well. Um, when I arrived and got on the ground, my own doubts about the war were really brought into bold relief. Um, what was our objective? It wasn't clear. The Marine Corps thrives on objectives. Everything's an objective. What was our objective? Kill the enemy? Fine. But the enemy's got plenty more people coming out. So that's not going to get us anywhere by itself. And the one question that really intrigued me during most of my tour there was, how would we know when we won? My frame of reference for combat and war in general was World War II, um, where we ended up our hostilities with two unconditional surrenders, and that was the end of that. There wasn't going to be an unconditional surrender here. It just, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, the enemy was not going to run out of men, which is what General Westmoreland tried to do. And it wasn't going to run out of the will to fight. And I think that was very clear even to us. Um, and in addition, we also were plagued by the fact that the United States was not behind us. In my generation, we'd been through college protests and all the rest of the mayhem that was going on. We also knew that the U.S. was looking for a way out. It had started to withdraw troops, and they weren't being replaced. Um, these troop withdrawals began in June of 1969, and they continued during my earliest, uh, in my period as a, as a forward observer. The troop withdrawal had a direct effect <clears throat> on my outfit because in November of 69, uh, the Third Marine Division decamped and went back to Okinawa. And when that happened, we got our, a number of our more experienced officers, lieutenant company grade officers in particular, who were getting toward the end of their tours, went home with the Third or went back to Okinawa. And in return, we received a lot of very inexperienced officers who had just gotten into country where they would, and they would came to us to serve out the rest of their tours. Um, this loss of experienced officers really had quite a morale impact on, on my outfit because we depended on them. But at the same time, the withdrawal, I think, uh, sparked hopes in us that we would also be withdrawn at some point and would not be there forever. <clears throat> During my time as an FO, I served with Delta 15 on a couple of long operations in uh, this wonderful place called the Arizona near Anwa. It was called the Arizona for a reason because it was supposed to be the Wild West and I found out that it was. Um, there were some hairy moments and some disappointments, um, but I have to say that uh, we came out of it pretty well. We ne did not have one KIA in our company during the time that I was with them. We had several wounded. Um, but after I left the company, I went back to my battery and was a fire direction officer at the battalion level for a couple of months. And then Fox Battery 
moved from Hanwha, where we at least had some role in the war. We were still shooting a lot. Uh, we, the infantry was getting into trouble. We constantly had fire missions. We moved to a hill closer to Da Nang, um, about halfway between Anwan and Da Nang, called Hill 65, which created problems of its own. One was we didn't shoot as much. Uh, we were getting closer to civilization, and we didn't get the fire mission requests. The other was we were closer to Da Nang, which was easier to access for troops who wanted to get into trouble, uh, either with drugs, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but based, and, and in, in addition to that, we had, <clears throat> we shared the hill with an Arvin battalion, South Vietnamese Arvin battalion. And I was, I really was struck by the fact that the concertina wire between us and the Arvins was a lot thicker than it was between us and the enemy. And I found out why. These, these folks were really not the crack troops that we had hoped they would be. And in fact, I never saw them do anything uh, besides try to steal gear from us. We looked for every opportunity that we could to keep shooting, because a busy Marine is a happy Marine. And when problems began, I think they began largely because we were not busy enough. We looked at uh, battery registrations. We would take on um, IOD missions and so forth. But we simply did not have the tempo of contact that we had when we were in Anwa. And we were in a static position. We couldn't move. We were stuck out there. One of the things we did to try to keep the tempo moving was we engaged in hip shoots, where we'd sling a couple of 105 howitzers underneath helicopters, fly them out to a remote location, drop them, lay them, and shoot for an hour or two, pick them up, and go back home, which did relieve some of the, some of the tension. But at the same time, it was pretty obvious that, that looking for trouble was not going to be the entire uh, the answer. I would say that <clears throat> if I look at my 12-month tour, the first six months were pretty combat intensive. Second six months, there was a very clear decline. And this created morale problems. Um, we, had, we had racial problems, Afro-American uh, racial problems. <clears throat> and they, you know, their arguments, and I talked to them at long, long length, their arguments was, well, we're bearing the brunt of this war, and I heard that from home. We had some drug problems, uh, but I would say that this was not a major issue for us, uh, partly because uh, the battery commander and I kept a very close eye on when people were going in and out of Da Nang, <clears throat> and we knew who the troublemakers were. And at the time, my battery commander was a, was a uh, captain who would have been a gunnery sergeant and breveted for the war. And he had his own special method of dealing with drug offenders, which he kept me out of. But I think he was quite effective. And as a result, we did have one or two exceptional people who, who or exceptions, who uh, went berserk at one time or another. But on the whole, our drug problem was pretty minimal. You've all heard about fragging. We never had a fragging incident, although I think we came close. Uh, we did, something did happen in Anwa. Two officers swear they heard the spoon fly off a grenade and they ducked for cover. Nothing happened. Uh, each one blamed the other for being the target, which was kind of curious. <laughs> so. But that was it as far as, as far as the fragging incidents were concerned. In late March, we received word that we were going to be embarking for home. Uh, this was long awaited, long rumored, and obviously most welcome. So we set to trying to prepare the battery with a vengeance. <clears throat> embarkation boxes, embarkation manifests, 
and above all, cleaning equipment. And when you have to clean howitzers in order to bring them back to the states and get past the fish and ag people, you have to clean them with a toothbrush. You have to go into every single nook and cranny and you have to make sure that each part of that howitzer is spotlessly clean. No microbes that are gonna come back to the states. <clears throat> when we had to do Jeeps, we'd tip them over on their side, do the same thing, scrubbing the undercarriage. It's a long, laborious process. I have pictures of it, I should have brought them. And everybody, because they knew we were going home, everybody was full tilt working for this. We had no problems at all. Then on the 1st of May, we invaded Cambodia, and our battery was told to stand down. We weren't going anywhere. Well, of course, that created problems of its own. Leadership problems, which we dealt with as best we could uh, by A, trying to find things to shoot at, and B, training and training and training. But at the same time, it was very clear that uh, the frustrations were mounting among everybody, including our executive officer, who um, was very frustrated about something one night, and he let his anger get the best of him. Uh, he went out to uh, employ a, uh, deploy a claymore on the, on the outward wire, and it went off and killed him. And we, the worst thing I ever had to do in that war was put him into a body bag piece by piece. Uh, the back blast caught him. And it was a lesson to all of us. Uh, don't get sloppy and keep your emotions under control. <clears throat> when I left the battery in September of 70, we had been deployed to a new area which offered more opportunities to shoot, uh, to become engaged, stay engaged, accomplish the mission, whatever it was. Uh, we were sent to a remote fire support base on top of a mountain called Fire Support Base Rider. Some of you may have known, heard about. It was uh, it's south of the Quezon Mountains and it oversaw the uh, Antenna Valley, which earlier on had been the scene of quite a lot of fighting. We were co-located at that time with an IOD device, uh, integrated observation device, which was basically a surveyed super periscope with a night vision device and a laser rangefinder that was pretty accurate out to about 30,000 meters. What this would do is produce a polar plot to an enemy, target, whatever else out there, and you had an almost unique surveyed fire mission all packaged and ready to go. It was deadly. But we didn't get a chance to use it very often. Uh, still, at the, at the same time, I think, you know, this was the war was going to continue to sort of trickle down, uh, and that was it was at that point that I basically came I came home. My tour was up. The one year tour I think was a savior for a lot of us because we knew we were not there for the duration, whatever that was. We knew we would be there for a finite period of time, and the more the war wound down the more important that one year tour became because you knew that however hopeless the situation looked or however frustrating, you were still going to be able to get out when your appointed rotation date came up. And then I came home and I'm here, which I'm profoundly grateful for. <clears throat>